Welcome. We're so glad you're here with us for today's Harper Lecture. The Harper Lecture series began in 1979 with Hannah Holborn Gray speaking in San Francisco. As the need for critical thought remains apparent in all areas of life, we proudly continue this signature program to bring you stimulating conversations and fresh ideas. Our UChicago community is a global one, and we are thrilled that technology can help us stay connected to one another. As you enjoy today's lecture, please note the following items. Your camera and video will be off. However, we encourage you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask a question at any time during the talk. Closed captions are available by clicking the box at the bottom of your screen. Click Show Subtitles to enable this feature. If you're having trouble with audio or video, please try shutting down programs in the background, or you can dial in from your phone. Thank you once more for joining us. We couldn't do this without you. Hello, welcome to tonight's Harper Lecture, Democracy in Peril. We have a panel of faculty tonight joining us, Professor Kathy Cohen from the Department of Political Science, Professor Marco Gardo from the Department of Sociology, Professor Tom Ginsberg from the Law School, Professor Monica Nalepa from the Department of Political Science, and Professor Kaushik Sundararajan from the Department of Anthropology. And our moderator is Will Howell. I'm Amanda Woodward, the Dean of the Division of the Social Sciences and the William S. Gray Distinguished Service Professor in Psychology. I'm so pleased to welcome you to, today, to today's event. On behalf of everyone in the Social Sciences and the UChicago Alumni Office, thank you for joining us. I want to take a minute to introduce you to our moderator, William Howell. Will is the Sidney Stein Professor of American Politics in the Harris School of Public Policy. He's also a faculty member professor in the Department of Political Science and the college. He also directs the Center for Effective Government. Will has written widely on separation of powers and issues, uh, separation of powers issues and American political institutions, especially the presidency. He is currently working on research projects on Obama's education initiatives, distributive politics, and the normative foundations of executive power. Professors, thank you all for joining us. Will, I'll hand things over to you. Well, thank you, Dean Woodward. What a pleasure it is to be here. It's a little, um, it's a little bit of a misnomer, right? We're at a Harper lecture, but we're not going to be giving a lecture, for starters. Um, and the title for our gathering is Democracy in Peril. But I think one of the tasks before us is to think about how democracy is not a single thing. It works on lots of levels. And there's not a peril. There are maybe perils. And then there also is our response to that peril. And it's our job to try to unpack that tonight. And we might try to do that in a couple of steps. First, by thinking about what the nature of the problems are, the nature of the threats are to democracy at home and abroad. And then also to think about how we as individuals, we as communities might respond to those threats in order to rejuvenate, in order to breathe life into democracy. Um, and I'm really pleased that we get to do this in conversation amongst such a fabulous group of folk who come from different disciplines and have different ideas and do different kinds of research along these lines. Um, Monica, I think we should start with you, if we could, because when we think about threats to democracy, one way to think about a threat to democracy is, is that, well, it all comes tumbling down at once. And it, cuts tumbling, it, it, it comes tumbling down because the military says, I'm fed up. I've had enough of these small d Democrats running the show, and they roll into town with their tanks and they claim power all at once. And they're, they're wearing uniforms while they're at it and it's absolutely clear that democracy is being taken down. And if democracy was taken down in the 20th century, it was precisely through coups. So the classical example is the coup in Chile, that, Chile that brought Pinochet to office after the democratic elections didn't uh, produce the candidate that uh, the conservative majority was hoping for. Uh, but that's no longer how democracy tumbles. Um, so, first of all, democracy tumbles much more often than it did in the 20th century, but it does it 
through stealth-like fashion. So before we know it, it's happened, but it happens so gradually. Um, and more of it happens in the, least, in the places we would least expect. Um, so just from talking from my neck of the woods, uh, 10, 15 years ago, if you asked uh, a post-communist scholar uh, for their predictions of what would be the, the, the tigers of Eastern Europe, the, the countries that would accelerate into democratic success the soonest, they would say, well, Poland and Hungary. And, uh, and today, uh, those are exactly the two countries that are uh, leading this trend in democratic backsliding uh, in a very slow fashion and often um, uh, with the support of their uh, voting populations. So say a couple of words about what's happened in Poland and Hungary. What does that look like in the last 10 or 15 years? Yeah, so, so the parliamentary regimes, so, so very different countries uh, when it comes to the way their, the political systems are organized in the United States. Uh, so it's actually pretty hard in the parliamentary regime context to, uh, to get an, uh, a, an absolute majority of seats in the legislature and to create a cabinet that allows you to rule alone. Like you often have to create uh, coalitions with other parties, which kind of makes, it, makes uh, rule more consensual and makes it harder actually to undermine rights of, of minorities and the opposition. But both in Poland and Hungary, uh, the, 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 the current rulers have actually been able to circumvent democratic institutions and produce an a, 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 a absolute majority in the legislatures, which then allow them to create uh, executives that they alone are responsible for. And uh, step by step, they've been dismantling a very carefully, for decades, put together institutions of democracy. Um, so Poland right now is facing a crisis at the border with, with Belarus. Uh, Hungary went through its own refugee crisis uh, a couple of years ago. It's not clear whether either of them are going to stay in the EU long term. Uh, but as I said, 10 years ago, this was a very unlikely scenario that nobody would have predicted. Right. They were going to be beacons of democracy in the aftermath of communist rule. And, and Tom, could you've studied constitutions all over the globe. And one way to think about this is that, well, Poland and Hungary and plenty of other small d democratic countries, you write down the right constitution, right? You get your institutions in order and you establish the right kinds of checks and limits on authority and democracy becomes self-enforcing, right? It's all about the constitution itself. But there are threats to constitutional governance, no? Right, of course. So yeah, constitutional structures obviously provide the mechanisms and the possibilities for mobilization for good things, but also for bad things and for the deconstruction of democracy specifically. So actually, Monica mentioned the Hungarian case and um, you know that really started to go downhill when Viktor Orban, the current, current prime minister, won a single election in the aftermath of the financial crisis. So the fact that he could do that and then write an entirely new constitution was a product of the prior arrangements. That would be impossible in the United States because constitutional amendment is so hard here. Um, but you know, in our own country we have also you know, opportunity structures for those who would like to uh, you know, undo democracy as well as those who want to mobilize for it. And just on that very point, um, thinking about constitutional amendment to restrict democratic opportunities, the way it happens in the United States is essentially the Supreme Court blessing steps that have been taken at various state level um, legislatures, which seem to be um, really targeting right now the right to vote. That's mm -hmm. really the major thing. And that's just a product of the constitutional structure that they can do that. And then this happens to be these nine people in Washington who get to decide if it's OK. Right, where the doing it is rolling back a core democratic protection. It also can take the form of marginalizing an independent judiciary itself, right? or or pushing back against a free and independent press. All of these sorts of actions we're observing in, in lots of countries where through democracy, we see steps taken to undo democracy. Right, there's definitely different modalities in different countries, there's no single playbook. But looking at all of these countries together, we can see the different moves that are done, the various points at which various elements of democracy, right, to vote, independent judiciary, a bureaucracy that you know, enforces electoral laws, electoral institutions, all those things can be attacked, you know, one at a time, depending on what, you know, the particular leader or backsliding party 
wants to do in that country. Yeah, and a funny thing is that it's not a funny thing, like <laughs> ha ha, but it's a it's a it's a thing that we struggle with. And you 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 alluded to this, Monica, that the the would be autocrat doesn't always run as a would be autocrat. No, in fact, uh, when 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 Orban won that first election in Hungary. Uh, he, uh, he took over Jobbik, which was the truly uh, radical right party, and everybody was breathing a collective sigh of relief that, thank goodness, that Jobbik did not get into the legislature. Right. Because We're free and clear now. Exactly. And I, I remember in his victory speech, he even uh, referred to that. Uh, and yet, then he just used uh, the, the fact that, that that party disappeared to take over their electorate and, uh, and started pandering to the, to the populace. Yeah, way. yeah. So we've been talking about countries that have at least some experience with or made some commitment to democracy and how then there's loss. There are other countries that are thinking about the extent to which they want to commit to democracy or drawing lessons about the efficacy of democracy while looking abroad. And, and, and Marco, take, a, take us to the Philippines. Sure. I, I want to I follow up on Monica's point and, and Tom's point as well that this moment is is different from the moment in the 60s and 70s when you see dictators across Latin America, Southeast Asia, and elsewhere take over. It's different, as Monica points out, because of the more stealth or gradual nature of, of uh, backsliding. It's, it's different, as Tom points out. So oftentimes, these would-be or quasi-autocrats are utilizing the law um, to roll back uh, liberties. But I, I'd suggest it's, it's also different um, because a lot of these leaders, in several cases, have electoral mandates, and they have after that huge popular mandates, they can be very, very popular, and they use the rhetoric of democracy. They say that they're you know, rolling back the freedoms of the media or undermining these institutional checks in the name of improving democracy. And what's stunning to me is that a lot of populations buy this line precisely because this is a moment where a lot of countries in the developing world, places that have, have become democratic for, and have stayed democratic for about 30, 20 or 30 years, have an experience of democracy and it's been fundamentally frustrating, disappointing. It's easy to see this moment of crisis as a moment happening right now. And it's true that there are signs that point to something utterly urgent about this moment, but I'd suggest that the moment of crisis started with the moment of democratization. And at that moment, a lot of folks were feeling, after the euphoria of initial democ democratization, there was a feeling of, oh, let's make this work, followed by real efforts on the ground, um, at the top, at the elite level, among ordinary people to make it work. And those efforts have produced very little fruit. In fact, they've produced bitter fruit. And so we've seen movements against corruption, movements against populism, um, all movements in a way, if you want to put it into one category, to fix democracy, to realize this, this image of democracy that was present at the moment of democratization in a lot of these countries. And frankly, I, I think what's, if there's something new about this moment is that those efforts are still there, but they're taking a different form. In a, the country I study, in the Philippines, they're moving away from liberal methods to more illiberal ones. In other words, instead of going through people power, or going through the constitution, or going through institutions, they're exploring strongman politics. And, and part of that, to get to your question, Will, part of that is, is that this isn't the Cold War anymore. Democracy doesn't have the same um, sacredness, the, the, the same uh, unthinkability outside it that it used to at a certain point in history. They look around, and yes, they see the United States, but they also see, see Singapore, at least the Philippines, they see China. And the incidents come up, say, more, more recently, COVID, and they think, gosh, do I want my country handling COVID this way, or do I want it handling this way? Mm -hmm. And they're an audience that's taking in this information, and it shapes their aspirations for the future. And if not COVID, then maybe it's the Jan 6 riots. Mm -hmm. You know, folks, in the, it's not news in the Philippines that that kind of stuff happens. You know, <laughs> it happens. But they see it happening in the United States, and that makes a difference. Because for a long time, the United States has played this role as, this, as the model to emulate. But now, if what they see happening, this kind of uh, this political disorder they see happening in a country like the United States, just like it happens in the Philippines, they say, so what's the point of trying to make our democracy look like that? So I guess what I'm saying, 
in response to your question, is that people are watching, and what happens in this country doesn't stay in this country. It shapes the people's political imaginations in other parts of the world, and it's quite consequential. Which then informs their willingness to make costly investments in democracy or alt alternative forms of government in their in their own countries. And so a guy like Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines comes along saying, I'll kill criminals or I'll kill drug dealers. And the, the appeal of that is an appeal of order. Uh -huh. They're used to the disorder that, that they've come to associate with democracy. And they're thinking, gosh, we've tried it this way for 30 years now. This guy is making us a promise. What do we have to lose at this point? And, and there was a piece of something that you said too that I, I don't want us to lose sight of, which is that it isn't just that would-be autocrats don't run on a platform of bringing autocracy to the fore. It's that um, they often use the language of democracy, right? That they, they it's in, in the name of the true people, right? That they're going to take these actions. It's, it's that they're restoring some sense uh, of commitment to the people that has been lost by these broken institutions. Well, that's a huge piece. You know, Duterte's appeal is not about returning to Marcos era style authoritarianism. It's about disciplining democracy. And that's the word that comes up. We like democracy, but we want it orderly. We don't like it the way we've experienced it for the last 30 years. Yeah. And so, you know, Coming to terms and recognizing that vision is, I think, crucial in evaluating what's happening in at least parts of the world like the Philippines. Yeah. Kashi, if, if I could come to you, because I think there's a piece here that I'd be eager to hear your thoughts on, which is, it's about how we think about the lineages of crises of democracy or mm -hmm. perils of democracy, um, and the notion that there was a a perfect democracy that then is being corroded is obviously problematic. Mm -hmm. And a thing that um, Marco is encouraging us to do is to think about not just this moment as a moment of disjuncture, yeah. but that it has deep historical lineages. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you might reflect a bit on, on those notions and how they sure. play out domestically or, or, or in another context. Sure. Uh, and maybe I will bring this to the US. And I'll bring this to the US as someone who grew up in India and moved here in my, in my mid-20s. and. Uh, I mean, let's be clear, democracy is in deep peril in India, probably in deeper peril in India today than it is in the US. But, uh, but I wanted to say a couple of things. And the first is that you know, America was never a truly representative democracy. It were, it's a country that has often made periodic and sincere attempts at it, but it never has been, right? So when I moved here from India, I saw things, and this is in the late 90s, I saw things like the Electoral College, which is a system that allows the loser of the popular vote to become president. I saw things like the Senate as a minoritarian institution. I saw things like massive gerrymandering. And these are not things that sort of create small swings, right? Um, the Republicans have won the popular vote once in the last 30 years. They've had the presidency for 12 of the last 30 years. The Republican, the, the Republicans have not represented a majority of the American population in the Senate since 1996. They've controlled the Senate majority for 17 of the last 25 years. And redistricting has already ensured that if the House today was constituted along 2022 lines, Republicans would be in the House majority without a single vote being cast. So that's not a reflection of the will of the people. That's electoral backroom maneuvering, right? So there's already something that is structural and systemic that has privileged minority rule. Now, every democracy has to have minority protections in place in order to be a democracy. Otherwise, you'd have a tyranny of the majority. This is why judicial review has been so important in the history of American representative democracy. But a democracy that enshrines minority rule cannot remain a democracy. And I think what we're seeing now in 2021 is the movement towards strategies and mechanisms that are attempting to institute and enshrine minority rule by any means possible. And that's a conversation I think we should have because I think that in significant measure, it is impossible to think through what that means without talking about the fact that Representative democracy, America cannot today be a truly representative democracy if it is not a multiracial democracy. And so unless we talk about, unless we reckon with the history and present of race in America, 
we can't really have a conversation about democratic backsliding in this country and the sort of attempts to institute minority rule. Okay, I, I want to get to this, this last point. It's, it's vital. But before, you said something that was striking, which is that a, a, a system of government that enshrines minority rule cannot remain a democracy. I could understand that in one of two ways. One way is that what we're observing through the institutions that you've characterized is the corrosion of or the corruption of democracy. An alternative way of thinking about it is, is that, well, as long as a minority retains positions of power to the exclusion of majorities, mm -hmm. that there's going to be a backlash against them. It's not sustainable. And in that sense, then the appeals of majorities will fall prey to the rhetoric of a strong man who may come forward and say, we will push back. Which or both of those do you have in mind? I think that's an open question, right? <laughs> I think that's the moment. I mean, it's, it's impossible to predict what the trajectory of this would be because I think this is a terrain of contestation in American politics today. It's, it's hard to say which way yeah. it will go. Yes, yes. Okay, good. I mean, not good again. <laughs> it's, <laughs> but I'm, we're, we're starting to unpack it a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and you pointed to, you start off in your comments by pointing to a set of electoral institutions um, and the representation of a party, but we can also think about other forms of politics and the opportunities availed to groups that are traditionally marginalized and don't participate in politics in ways that at least in our discipline in political science, we're used to, accustomed to thinking about, right? It's who votes and who gives money and whatnot. And mm -hmm. Kathy, help us open up this space where we think about how um, the health of a democracy, where, where do we locate the health of a democracy? How do we think about the, 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 the functioning of a democracy, particularly as it relates to, to groups that have been systematically marginalized in right. politics? Right. Well, the, the first thing I would do is to say, I think, as you noted, in our discipline, in the discipline of political science, we often talk about guardrails and the current crisis. And I think we're often pointing to kind of processes of governing. Are people allowed to vote? Is there an attack on institutions? Do they believe, in fact, uh, the outcomes of a vote? Is there forbearance? Do we, are we able to, in fact, reach compromise with the other side? And I think that is one way of thinking about kind of the crisis of democracy. I think an, another way is to center subjects, as you suggest, who are often on the outside or on the margins. And so when Kashik talks about uh, thinking of the United States and coming here from India, I can say, well, I was born in here, <laughs> born in the United States, but many in my communities never felt like full citizens, even though we had citizenship, right? that there's a long history of exclusion. Now, there are ways in which people have compensated for kind of the formal exclusion um, that we've seen in this country, and we can talk about that later, one being social movements, the other being, you know, uh, eventually there are, in fact, people who are able to run. We open up possibilities. We talk about the Reconstruction Amendments that abolish slavery, that provide for citizenship and provide for voting. But I, I do think that beyond the thinking of the kind of processes of democracy, what is the feel of democracy? Hmm. How do I live democracy, right? Do I understand myself to be an equal citizen? If I, if I really think about kind of the health of our democracy, how do I make sense of the history of enslavement that moves from enslavement to sharecropping and convict leasing, that moves from that to Jim Crow, that moves from that to um, mass incarceration, right? The ways in which there's been a systemic and perpetual exclusion, or at least pushing to the margins of certain groups. And I think that, that worries me just as much, if not more, than if, in fact, the kind of processes of a democracy are, in fact, we allowing people to vote. And, and, and that's not, I don't want to minimize, right, the importance of voting and the restrictions on voting. But I don't think that by providing at the at surface level everyone access to the vote, that we deal with the processes of the feel of being excluded from the democracy. And, and how then do we, in fact, open up 
and demand, in fact, that we reimagine the working of democracy, not just so that the processes work, but that people feel included, that they're full citizens, that they're provided for opportunities, um, and that, in fact, they're written into a, a history that has long excluded them. So I think when we think about the health of democracy, of course we want to think about kind of certain measures, but I also want us to think about kind of how people feel in, in, the, in the democracy. So it's not just about the design of institutions no. or the elections that are or are not held. It's about um, people's relationship to the state and how they understand notions of belonging are central markers or, or vital markers for us thinking about the health of a democracy. Right. But I, I don't want to exclude those. I want to yeah, think yeah, yeah. about the interaction, right? Because, in fact, the design of the processes, right, the it's ways in which we write the Constitution matters in terms of if, in fact, you're fully included, what you have to do to be counted, what you have to do to kind of raise your voice. So it's not one or the other. And what I am worried about in our discipline is that quite often we see this moment as a crisis, as opposed to individuals. We center individuals who have long been excluded. They would tell you that this is not a crisis, it's yet another crisis in uh -huh. democracy. And so when we talk about the kind of perils of democracy, we have to have a kind of long history, a long view of the ways in which those perils have evolved and how different groups have, have kind of risen to the challenge to, to really kind of help us be the democracy that we've promised to be. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if like, the language of crisis is just, is just, is just the wrong language. It's rather to think, of, do we want to say something like, the, the limits or the defects or the structural failings of what do you want to say that there's something built into or do you want to say that no there are there's democracy right. which is full of promise yes. and possibility yes and then there are our hmm, failed attempts right. to realize yes. and our, our our lack of commitment to right well, but I don't want to minimize it I don't want to diminish it something about crisis means that, in fact, we have to kind of muster uh, the resources, the will at this particular moment to deal with what, in fact, we believe the crisis is. So I want to suggest, in fact, that it's not just this crisis, but that a series of crises that we have to be paying attention to, right? And, and so much, I believe, about this crisis is a kind of post-Trump, well, we're, it's not maybe not post-Trump crisis, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to imagine that if we addressed all the issues and all the failings of what some people believe to be a kind of Trump administration, the Trump attack on our democracy, we would still be left with you know, disproportionate incarceration. We would still be left with black people being killed by the police. We would still be left with severe income inequality. We would still be left with underfunded schools. And I want to suggest that that's also a part of the crisis of democracy that we have to solve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I pick up on that? Please. I want to follow up on that. So, uh, you know, I think about uh, the right to vote, critical part of democracy. And we tend to sort of, you know, have deep inside us this idea that it's progress. We just expand the franchise, and over time it expands, and, you know, we're getting there. And when you actually look at American history, it's not like that at all. If you go back to the 18th century, there were actually states where property holding women could vote, where free black people could vote, and all of those were eliminated in the 19th century. Then, of course, we have the 15th Amendment, but that gets eliminated in large parts of the country. Then you have the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s, and that has recently been gutted in two critical Supreme Court cases. So, you know, maybe I guess I'm questioning <laughs> the, the idea that we're actually progressing. Maybe it is a permanent state of, you know, yeah. wrestling and, you know, uh, you know, it's a much slower thing than a crisis language would suggest. Well, can, can I, I mean, I, and I want to just jump on with Tom said, I think that's absolutely right. I think we have to unpack why we think this is a crisis at this moment. And I think it is a crisis not only about the attacks on the institution, but the constituency that seems to be worried about the democracy at this moment, right? That um, if we think about race, uh, and the exclusion of African Americans. It is, I believe, in fact, that many white citizens uh, are worry about the democracy at this moment, that we now say it is a crisis. And, I, I, and I, you, we might want to unpack that a bit, but I do think that is part of, of the uproar that we're seeing at this moment. Yeah. I, can, I, can I jump in? I mean, I still think it's a luxury that we're discussing participation in democracy, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the backsliding cases or the straight up authoritarian cases, 
that I'm familiar with are where the, the right to contest is, is, is limited, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you look at Russia, where every single uh, a potential opponent of Putin has been either murdered or imprisoned or, or attempted to be uh, murdered and then imprisoned. Um, so, if, so, so do you, are we talking about this in the context of the United States because there is consensus that as far as who contests office is open to all? So say a bit more about that. You, so can, can do you, do you, so are you, are the are, are the people to elect mm -hmm. available, right? So um, so if if everybody who is in, who who should be entitled to vote were allowed to vote, mm -hmm. would the problems be solved? Well, I think I think not, right? That has to do with the kind of inequality that we find the money in politics. Not everyone has uh, the ability to run. We know that. The, the Congress is often a, a, a body of millionaires, and most people in the world, of course, are not, and in, in the United States are not. Um, so I, I think that's part of the issue, is that if we are thinking that, as Tom said, that we can solve this with elections, or if we can solve it with just kind of making sure that uh, different people run, I, I, I don't think that does it completely, and maybe Marco wants to change. No, 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 I, I agree with a lot of what you said, Kathy, and, and I, I've been thinking about this term crisis, and it has a kind of a discrete, contained in the present mm -hmm. kind of um, kind of character that, that's not getting at the regularity mm -hmm. that, that you're talking about. Uh, but then following the conversation, it does feel like something's different and something's mm -hmm. perhaps new and something's alarming. Um, maybe it's a kind of disenchantment that's been setting in, a disenchantment with democracy, and I wonder if our faith in, in democracy solving our problems has not been undermined or eroded precisely because of, first, this is, people know this has been happening for a long time. It's not a new story, it's an old story. Right. But it's also great, great inequalities that surround us. Um, and so thinking ahead about what could be done, perhaps maybe the vote was the solution at a different point in history, but it certainly does not seem that way today. Maybe political engagement was the solution at a different point, even in American history. But today, perhaps there's a sense of impotence such that it doesn't come out in organized movements, but in anger, in, in, in a kind of a, you know, a semi-spontaneous expression of frustration. Mm. And that seems particular to this moment. I mean, I, I understand that when I talk about the Philippines, there is that kind of frustration. Um, but the causes are often very different. Here in the United States, there is that same, there is a kind of sense of impotence of frustration, and I wonder if, if that's what's new, but that's different from crisis. It's almost as if after enough crises, there's an exhaustion and... And, and, uh, the, and disenchantment. The disenchantment, and, and it, but what that crucially means is that people are, are perhaps for the first time in a long time entertaining the idea that democracy is not enough, or there might... Or some other system can deliver. Possibly. Mm -hmm. it, where, and the examples that you gave of delivering meant it was about performance in part. It wasn't just about the representation of interests or notions of belonging. It was also about can, we've got a problem, well, COVID, what, what, and are we, can we actually attend to this? Well, in the Philippines in particular, that's, that's especially urgent. Mm -hmm. you, you take something like COVID, precisely because of what's, where it's located, and the fact that there are two performances going on. They've always been attuned to the one performance, the United States, but increasingly the Chinese, inform, the Chinese TV show is getting far more interesting. Mm -hmm. And they're also you know, making overtures to, to, to the Philippine audience and saying, do you really want to be like those guys? Mm -hmm. Look at what we've, we've locked down COVID. You know, Duterte took a page from Chi's playbook. Mm -hmm. Lockdown, the lockdown just, just started to ease recently. Mm -hmm. um, people weren't allowed to leave their houses. And they say, this is how we do it. This is what's effective. None of that mamby-pamby stuff that I see going on over there, mm -hmm. resulting in hundreds of thousands of deaths. Mm -hmm. People look at this and they, they think, and that affects how they vote, how they act. And the investments they're willing or not willing to be made into democracy. If we think about, if we think about democracy not as just a, a thing, you know, the precious egg that we hold, yeah. but that a thing that one has to make investments into, one, that one has to rejuvenate, that then one's willingness to make those costly investments is informed in part by, I hear you saying, um, 
the return that you expect. And when you look around and you see examples of failure, sure. that then there's this, there are other ways to go and other countries saying, here, come down this path instead. And its aura is simply less compelling, less compulsive than it used to be. It's less sacred. And so it commands less credibility, less faith, mm -hmm. perhaps. Kaushik. So, so just a couple of things here, not really a pushback, but a kind of specification, because I do agree on the one hand that, that we have to look at the longer durée. This is part of my argument, right? And, and that is to say that if we're thinking about, if we're thinking the democracy in crisis now, it's not a crisis that is sort of disturbing this pure, pristine state of halcyon democracy, but it's a, it's a crisis that's disturbing something that was very imperfect to start with. Having said that, I do think that there are crisis points at the moment in, in the US. And I think that, that part of the crisis here is I don't sense a sort of generalized disenchantment with small d democratic processes that are opening up to a large scale appeal for the authoritarian. In fact, I think over the last five years, we have seen a remarkable small d democratic mobilization and resistance against authoritarianism. Nonetheless, democracy is in peril, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and so, so, so the, Part of what's at stake is figuring out what are these long durée sort of structural imperfections that we've never really addressed head on. And what is it that's manifesting in particularly acute ways now? And I think what's manifesting in a particularly acute way now is that for the last 30 years, it's been possible to square the circle with the myth that a little bit of minoritarianism is fine and so we don't really have to do, deal with the fact that demographic transition in this country is effectively making one political party unelectable unless they open themselves up to multiracial democracy. Right? Now we're dealing with that fact. Right? We're dealing with that fact that unless one political party <coughs> radically reimagines itself, i.e. sheds its current avatar, if representative democracy is allowed to function, it's never going to win an election, right? And so I think there's really a kind of structural crisis here where the entrenchment of minority, minority rule is almost the only path forward for a Republican party that has not followed its own diagnosis post 2012 to open itself up to a more multiracial democracy. And therefore we're seeing you know, 33 new voter suppression laws in 19 states just this year. So, so just, I mean, what you're saying is, I mean, it's this interaction yeah. between minoritarian rule and, and partisanship. What's going on within a party? This is not about equal opportunity minority rule. It's about the, the, the pushback that we're observing in the state legislature are, are in Republican states. And the, if, you're, if we're concerned about the Supreme Court, the last three Supreme Court justices were appointed by a court, excuse me, by, the, by a president who failed to win a majority of the vote um, and were conform, confirmed in a Senate that represented less than a majority of the country, That's right? right? And, that, the, and, so, and, and, and recognizing those facts, we then see a major, the major Republican Party doubling down on this. Yes. Rather than reimagining itself as you would like to see it in the name of improving our democracy, we see it doubling down on efforts to suppress and marginalize and which have, yes. don't, they don't just have the effect of, that's what rolling back democracy is. And in this business model, that's the only tenable way they can go forward unless they really, unless that party is choose mm -hmm. this avatar and, and radically rethinks itself. I want to disagree with that. Mm -hmm. And I think we had this election the other, the other week in Virginia, which um, suggests that maybe that analysis is, um, is no longer um, as, as accurate as it seemed a month ago. Um, the Virginia election took place under rules that were written by Democrats. They got rid of all the Republican restrictions on voting, the voter ID laws, they had extended time period, and the Republicans won that election fair and square. Mm -hmm. um, and that, to me, I sort of was saying, you know, maybe that's one cheer for the Virginia election because it suggests that the party does have a way out uh, that doesn't involve suppressing the vote as is going on in many other states. Now, they did that on the basis of, you know, 
culture war issues and race-based mobilization. So I'm not, you know, it's not three cheers, but it's one cheer. And suggests that there might be enough of a multiracial coalition in a diverse state like that for them mm -hmm. to get through. I think that maybe we ought to sometimes disaggregate our discussion mm -hmm. and focus on states. I think we're headed for a period where there's going to be some sort of subnational authoritarian states like there were for under the Jim Crow era. Uh, we may be headed that way. But at a national level, you know, we're going to have others where democracy, as we define it, is thriving. And then the question is, which of those is able to capture the national institutions? Mm -hmm. Can we come back? I think it, when we think about thriving, not thriving, what is the sort of margin on which we're trying to make a difference? I heard you say earlier, Monica, that well, there are, there are other countries wherein one cannot run for office without the threat of not just the threat of, but actually being assassinated. There are, there are, I mean, when we think about like where we're working, there, there are lots of margins. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the, the, in, in the Soviet Union, the, the right to vote was uh, universal. Moreover, voting typically occurred during the weekends, which I am puzzled for the 20 plus years I've lived in this country. Why does voting occur on Tuesdays when the most marginalized and vulnerable populations uh, have to risk losing their job in order to cast their vote? But that's a that's a separate uh, issue, somewhat. But one one thing that I wanted to caution against is is romanticizing civil society, right? Mm -hmm. So we we tend to, I mean, especially in Europe, right? There's this belief that civil society brought down communism in, in Eastern Europe. But now the backsliding that is happening there is largely thanks to mm -hmm. civil mm -hmm. society in a very uh, rightist nationalist um, garb, mm -hmm. uh, where. You know, I mean, you could see that on Veterans Day, which is Independence Day in Poland, where buildings were set on fire, um, uh, public monuments were torn down, and it's like this every single year. And that is also an outburst of, of civil society. So, um, so I think that there's a tendency in our conversation to sort of be anti-aristocratic and sort of like bemoan the minority institutions, but it's not necessarily the case, as I think the yeah. Philippines show uh, that. Uh, popular or direct democracy is necessarily exactly. better. So we so we're gonna welcome people's questions and we want to turn to them shortly. So please do send them in. Um, before we start taking some questions though, we've got to say something about what a response to these various threats looks like. I mean there, and just as there are multiple threats, so too must there be multiple responses. But let's let's kind of read some of them into the record. What does it mean to stand up to a would-be autocrat? Or what does it mean to make deeper investments in a democracy or to recover uh, kind of a set of democratic commitments that historically we haven't lived up to but that still have promise and meaning? What it, come on, give us something. Kathy, get us started. Sure, I, I'm happy to. I mean, I would maybe just do the reverse of, okay. of my earlier conversation with just to say, <laughs> I have deep faith in the power of people to act collectively, to make demands on the democracy to be better, to make demands on the democracy to expand from the abolitionist movement to the suffragist movement to uh, labor to, you know, to the civil rights movement and now the movement for black lives, the movement around climate change. There are the movement around immigration rights, right? There are all kinds of ways in which we could say that people who have been excluded have decided, in fact, that democracy doesn't work for them. But instead, what is amazing to me is that, in fact, those same communities gather together collectively to make demands to say, we believe, in fact, that our inclusion is important and the democracy can expand and be better, right? And I, I think there are ways in which people can even look at the mobilizations that happened in 2020 in response to uh, the murder of George Floyd and say, well, that was you know, out of control or they talked about divest. Um, but in fact, what these young people did, and it was often young people, was to kind of expand and say, we can't have policing in, in that form anymore. And we have to think broadly 
about what it means to reimagine public safety. What does it mean to kind of center communities? What does it mean, Monica and I were talking about, to experiment and thinking differently about democracy, possibly not at the national level, but at local levels, in cities, in communities. And I think that's part of the response, is to believe, in fact, that people can innovate, that people can make different demands, that people can expand the democracy to make it work. And I, and I think organizing is easier now, thanks to social media, thanks to just the ubiquity of accessing political news. I mean, I, I'm going to reach back to Poland now when, uh, when I was participating in one of the, the protests against the ruling uh, coalition. And uh, I, I overheard a conversation between two teenagers who were talking not about what newest club in Warsaw they had visited, but what is the last protest that they went to? And I was like, oh my God, this is so different than my experience growing up in um, you know, capitalist democratic Poland where we're completely disinterested in politics. So the, the disinterestedness or the disenchantment that we referred to earlier would be understandable. And yet, and yet right, there are moments that where there is a, a response, and the response doesn't just come from within well-established parties or within well-established electoral systems, they can come from, from below that push back against. And we can keep, we, we, we're getting, there are all kinds of questions coming in, and we need to turn to those, <laughs> Let's do it. okay? So let me, let, me read, let me read some out, and then you guys can you know, jump in on this. So um, the first one is from uh, Ibrahim Baik, I hope I got that right, or roughly. When democratic institutions are used in a way that weakens democracy, when democratic institutions are used in a way that weakens democracy, could this suggest that democracy may have a limited life cycle that we have yet to grasp? That is, right, if the vulnerabilities are baked into the system, we got you've got to take the first crack at this, right? Well. If they're baked into the system, yeah. then our, what does that say about the, the strength of democracy itself, our understanding yeah. of it? I mean, democracies have a hard time selling themselves to their own citizens because, of course, we're always free to complain. Uh, and so, you know, there, there, there's this always, I think, this sense of disenchantment and now an increasing sense of risk. At the same time, if you think about democratic values, they're pretty deeply baked in mm -hmm. and citizens don't want to have their speech suppressed. They don't want to have their voice marginalized. They, they do want to participate. And I think that sentiment is actually only growing stronger. So then the question is, how do we channel it? You know, the founding fathers of the United States didn't think the republic would last this long. They thought it would be long over by now. They'd be stunned to know that we were still being governed by this constitution uh, adopted in 1787. And, uh, you know, that shows you that, and I think the comparative politics literature is clear on this, empirically, democracy is very unlikely to actually die once it has been entrenched for a certain amount of time. It has struggles, but it lasts longer than you might otherwise think. Should we find some faith in that? That is, mm. or is this just some turbulence in the air that we're experiencing right now to the extent that there is something of a crisis happening now? It's layered on other crises. And we say, but, but our deep-seated kind of commitments to democracy as individuals will see us through? Well, American history isn't really pretty when you go back. And so that leads you to the sense, well, we're often in the sense of crisis, but maybe the sense of crisis is good in terms of mobilizing us to act and organize and... Um, you know, mm -hmm. renew our renew our institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to uh, to build upon that because I think that's an important point. What I what I hear Tom saying is that there are democratic institutions, but they by themselves are not enough. There are also democratic values, and to that extent, what you call turbulence, some amount of grousing, some complaining, some experimenting, isn't necessarily bad, and is perfectly in keeping with a democracy in which people feel they have sufficient agency to complain, that they will be heard, or at least that they can speak. Right? And, and so to the extent that um, people are, are malcontents, <laughs> you know, insofar as democracy breeds a kind of malcontented attitude, that's not necessarily a bad thing because it presumes first that people feel they have a voice. Whether or not they'll be heard, maybe that's a second question, but that they can speak and that perhaps their voice might amount to something. And, I, and I'd suggest that that's actually very different in places where they feel they, they can't speak. It's a different kind of relationship to the state, as you said, a different kind of citizenship. Democracy builds, it breeds a kind of thick citizenship and you're expected to push back. You're expected to be active. So in some ways, there's a way to read this moment, not entirely as, as a defeat, but in some ways as a vitality. 
I mean, democracy, just like now, when we talk and we have different points of view, or in any class, I mean, that's democracy at its best, a kind of public sphere that takes shape and people feel they don't have to censor themselves. They don't have to repress themselves. They can say, this, I, I disagree with you. This is, my, this is what I think. And I say, I don't like that idea, but I'm going to keep talking to you. I mean, I think that's democracy at its, at its healthiest. Okay. I don't like you just described the University of Chicago. But. <laughs> Can I just, I, I, I think Marco is right uh, about the kind of, expect, I know we have to be quick, the expectation of a democracy that people can have voice. But I think actually, when we look at our data on young adults, for example, we find, in particular for African Americans, they're much less likely to um, conform to the idea or accept the idea of democratic values and norms, right? They push back on that. They don't feel like, in fact, they can hold on to the Constitution or that the Constitution applies to them. They don't necessarily feel like they are full citizens. They're not always supportive of freedom of speech because that speech is often turned on them. So I, I, I think we, again, have to disaggregate both from the federal to the local level, but also across groups to say, what does it mean to be positioned different in a democracy? And what does it mean, of course, to have voice, but really to question even the fundamentals of norms and values that we think might save the democracy? I want to read another question, and I'm going to come to you, Kaushik, if I could, because it's related to the conversation that we're having right now. And it comes from uh, Jill Reit. Oh, Jill, I hope I said your last name correctly. Um, it, she says, are citizens giving up their right to be heard? Are we leaving the driving of our nation to elected leaders without exercising the oversight that we were given through engagement beyond the ballot box? I mean, there's a recognition that the kind of accountability that we need for a healthy democracy is not just electoral accountability. Our votes, or our votes merely partisan? So. Are citizens giving up their right to be heard, or are they insisting upon being heard? And what, what impact then does that have on trajectories of democracy? See, I think, I mean, again, to sort of get specific about this, I'm, I feel very concerned about this moment, right? Uh, I don't think citizens are giving up their right. I agree that, that's, that democracy is much more than what happens at the ballot box. I agree about the importance of organization and mobilization from above. But I also come from a country, India, where institutions have been lost. And, and this is why I'm becoming, you know, the older I get, the sort of more of a conservative institutionalist I become, because you only realize how valuable institutions are when you've lost them. Mm. And when institutions are lost, however vibrant you might have, you know, from the grassroots, it's very hard to get them back. And so on the one, I mean, this, this is where Tom, I guess, I guess, you know, I'm, I agree with you halfway about Virginia, but not all the way, because on the one hand, of course it was a legitimate democratic election, and of course it reflected a whole series of failures of the Democratic Party that have to be taken into account. But one of the elements of, of the current democratic moment that I do think is a real peril is the explicit willingness to turn to and sanction political violence as a means to achieve one one's ends, not just at the sort of big January 6th insurrection level, but at the level of at attacking the bedrocks of grassroots democracy, such as election officials and school board members, right? And that's not just the vibrancy of populist sentiment. There's money that's going into that. There's dark money that's going into that, and it's organized. And it's, and it's really kind of attacking institutions at a foundational level, not just at a kind of organized level. So I don't think that citizens are giving up, you know, um, any kind of investment in the democratic project in this country. Quite the contrary, there may be very different ideas of what that democratic project, what an ideal democratic project looks like. But I think there's deep investment in it. But the question is, you know, the sort of normative guardrails that kind of sanctioned what the limits of that would be. It's not the first time they're breaking down in the history of the American political experiment, but they certainly are breaking down in some quite radical ways. And, and that sort of the specter of political violence here really scares me. And the, the breaking down and the violence that is observed is a function, if I hear you right, not so much of individuals renouncing democracy or falling out of love with democracy, mm -hmm. but that those who are attacking democracy or propagating violence are organized and funded and have strategy. And, and haven't been curtailed. So I think, you know, I mean, Steve Libitsky's and Daniel Ziblatt's book is an important book. It's been discussed a lot. One can take issue with specific elements of it. But something that they say that's very important is that 
in a norm-based democracy like America, and especially in a two-party norm-based de democracy like America, the role of the political party as a guardrail is very, very important because the political party is the sort of ultimate enforcer of norms. And so if one political party decides not to enforce certain norms, such as not even make a chirp about the fact that an elected member of Congress is tweeting imaginary death threats against another elected member of Congress, then we're on, then democracy is on sand, I think. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. The, that, that really worries me. But that kind of is the definition of crisis, right? I mean, I feel like that the four-year Trump presidency exposed like all the places where norms should have been replaced with institutions. So, you know, I mean, to, to look more optimistically at that, like now we know what to fix, right? Because we know exactly where the vulnerabilities are. Mm -hmm. But who's the we who gets to fix oh, them? Oh yeah, no, yes. that's, the, that, that's the ultimate is, is question. What's, <laughs> is what scares me. Yeah. yeah, and a system that is, where in power is as divided as it is, and systemic change is really hard to do. It's just heavy work, and then, when the only service of democracy is going to come from one party and you have the slimmest of majorities, that one party is barely holding on and the betting markets are suggesting that it's going to lose at least one chamber at the next midterm. And you think, all right, how are we going to, having, having observed, you know, having, having been subject to the stress test and the vulnerabilities have been observed, is there can we reasonably hope that the action is going to follow and that the corrections are going to be made? I have a, I've got to, we got to keep going here. Yeah. We've got, they're pouring in, Tom. Send the, <laughs> here. Give us the next one. Here's another one. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, this one would be good for, to, for both uh, Marco and Monica because, well, here's the question from Rena Fowler. Um, communism failed, but the U.S. has promoted democracy for decades and now its own system themes seems under threat. Do we need to talk about governance more broadly? What might work, whether it's called democracy or something else? There's, okay, so if, we, if we're going to say that communism was a meaningful alternative, but that there's a shared sense that it failed, but that maybe democracy is failing too, and that maybe the game is not all about betting on democracy. It's about creating something altogether new, and that's part of the discussion that's happening. Is it happening in Eastern Europe? I mean, it's happening in the Philippines. I mean, communism failed, I would say, maybe I, maybe I wouldn't go as far as saying despite uh, the democracy promotion efforts, but, uh, but at the same time that uh, communists were being fought in Eastern Europe, uh, rightist dictators were being uh, propped up in Latin America. So I think that there's been sort of like a divided and there was also a moment when the United States intervened in a perfectly democratically fair election uh, in Eastern Europe and to the balance, which I think sort of like prolonged uh, the, the democratic chaos in Poland for at least half a decade. So I would be very careful with characterizing the US as a democracy promoter. I mean, there certainly have been um, efforts to consult and to aid, but look, the, the, the constitution that um, American experts helped uh, Yeltsin write lasted all of what, three years? And now we have Putin, so. Um. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think you're, um, Rita, her name? Rina, yeah. Rina is, is astute in pointing out that we might, think to, we might need to think about governance more broadly. And if anything, we're wiser insofar as it's harder to confuse democracy in terms of an electoral system and certain, a certain set of institutions with good governance anymore. And I think there was a moment um, for countries like the Philippines in the 80s and 90s, where people assumed that once you got democracy, you got good governance, as if those two things got together. Well, they've been disabused of that mm -hmm. very, th very thoroughly. Um, and I don't think it, it, it's just the Philippines. Um, so I'd say that you know people are thinking about governance. But I'd also be careful because, again, it, it, it might sound like people are rejecting democracy and turning to authoritarianism. And, and I'm not sure that's what I see happening in the Philippines. I think people are expressing dissatisfaction with actually existing democracy as it's been practiced. And I think there's a spirit of experimentation in the air. I, I think they're, they're looking at democracy and they're saying, you know what, we like this mechanism of consultation. We like that we get to vote. That last period of authoritarianism, 
maybe there were more roads and buildings, but it wasn't that great. We also remember that a lot of people were killed and a lot of people were put in prison. So I don't think you can just banish that as if there's a new generation. Those people are still around and they tell their stories and they pass that on. So, so I don't think, it, I don't think it's, it's a rejection of democracy and an embrace of authoritarianism. I think it's a, it's a thinking through democracy into, into something that serves them better from a governance perspective. In other words, we'd like to keep elections, but we'd like people who know what they're doing. We'd like stronger institutions somehow. But you're not talking about kind of coming to terms with democracy. You're talking about experimenting with democracy and thinking anew about what that form might take. You know, the old paradigm in the political science literature is one of consolidation, and that just means making institutions stronger. But really what it meant on the ground to a lot of people is making, say, Philippine democracy look more like U.S. democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think that paradigm, it, perhaps it's time has passed. That's not selling. <laughs> it, it's a hard sell these days, I'll tell yeah. you that. Yeah. yeah. I think that was the problem with democracy promotion in the sort of, you know, po immediately post third wave of democratization era, where we got the model right, yeah. it worked in Eastern Europe, like now it's going to work everywhere, and it just fell apart. I exactly. And so it's not necessarily that they want to get rid of democracy, they're just tired of this model and, and they're looking for different ones and they're casting their eyes about. But that doesn't mean that they want a one party state necessarily. Okay, we've got a number of questions that are going to build off of this. Um, which, this one, I'm, I'm going to read the one from Peter Maharis, um, but there are a number that are like this and it builds off of this point. Uh, Peter's wondering, is there anywhere we can turn to as a model for turning away from a democratic backslide? Think about like, what's a, what's a model for, we're not going to name a country in a year and say they got it exactly right. That, that right? We're not going to, but I think we could point to moments or commitments. Kathy, earlier you were pointing to a set of social movements that, sure. that were democracy enhancing as a, as a kind of model. Are there, are there others that we want to point to? Go ahead. You. No, you, you go first. Go. Well, um, so Aziz Huck and I wrote a couple of papers on this. We call them democracy's near misses. Situations where you see this backsliding going on and then something happens. Colombia, the constitutional court stopped a term limit uh, takeover. Sri Lanka, we look back to Finland. One of the things all those cases have in common is that it was institutions that were not democratically legitimated that ended up saving mm -hmm. the democracy. Electoral commissions, courts, you know, militaries in some cases. And I think we just saw that in the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, hundreds of local, thousands, mm -hmm. tens of thousands of local voting officials are who saved our democracy, as well as generals who didn't answer the call. No, I, I was going to suggest the exact same thing, that again, at the local level, I think we see these moments of people intervening to save the democracy. They are doing what they expect to be is just their job. Mm. But in many ways, by just doing their job, they're saving democracy. And, and to this point, I, I also think that people are experimenting within maybe the confines of what we might call a democracy all the time at the local level. You know, we see uh, cities and locales deciding on ranked choice voting, right? It's an attempt to say we want to kind of infuse preference and intensity into the voting scheme. Commissions that say instead of gerrymandering, we're going to kind of figure out how districts should be situated. I think people are always trying to, again, better democracy. And I guess maybe that's the, the backstop on the sliding. But these are two different, I mean, the, the backsliding coming from uh, grassroots organizations yeah. and coming from people, mm -hmm. um, or the correction coming from uh, a military or a court, which were the kind of minoritarian institutions, mm -hmm. Kaushik, that you were saying, to the extent that we're seeing them increasingly sort of becoming the norm and the voice of majorities being squelched is problematic for democracy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these are, I mean, they're interesting. They're coming from different, yeah. different quarters. Mm -hmm. but, but I don't, I don't think you can, every institution set up in democracy has to be majoritarian. I mean, I think a, a democracy is a whole system of institutions. And I think what, I, I think the way to reconcile what Kathy and Tom are saying is that the, in this, mm -hmm. a, a long-lived democracy is one where there are multiple layers of these institutions. Exactly. And what prevents backsliding is like, hopefully in one of them, there's going to be somebody who believes that, you know, they're going to do their job and not let this slide. So maybe that's the advantage of, you know, living in a country where a constitution has lasted over two centuries. But, but I also think there's, you know, I mean, 
I don't know that any place is a democratic model because I think there's democratic fragility everywhere. But there is also a lot of democratic vitality everywhere in some of these places, Tom, where you suggest. And I think urban politics in America is really one of those places where, you know, it's, it's messy, it's fraught, <laughs> but, there, but there are real experiments in multiracial democracy mm -hmm. that, are being, that are being actualized. The question then becomes one of jurisdiction and, you know, I mean, I mean what, what happened with voting rights in Houston in the 2020 election mm -hmm. was extraordinary. And therefore, there have been moves to curtail it, right? And so that question of, of where authority lies. But I think part of, there's an interesting comparative question also here about the relationship between macro institutional structures and sort of experiments from below, right? Mm -hmm. And so this isn't to idealize any constitution or, but, but South Africa's first pu public policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic was to extend universal childcare grants to all women. Mm. That was a constitutional response, right? The immediate constitutional response here was armed militia outside state capitals talking about freedom. Mm. So there are also very different, which, which at one level could be imagined as a sort of expression of popular democratic sentiment too. So there are also these very different kind of political cultural response of what things like the constitution means, how it materializes in terms of relationships between freedom and equality, you know, uh, the sort of, like that sort of idea that freedom is something that's radically individualistic and therefore any attempt at social equality is antithetical to freedom is not the ideal of freedom that's enshrined in the South African constitution, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think that there are, you know, I mean, there's democratic vitality everywhere. But the question is whether they'll be allowed to flourish. <laughs> so is that the thing to look for? I mean, do you think that, I mean, when you say that there's democratic vitality everywhere, mm -hmm. there's like a, like a core kind of longing to be engaged and to, and to um, be free or that is basic, and then the question is whether or not that is unleashed. Is that the notion? Or it's allowed. about tapping into something fundamental. And so when we look for, we have a question in here, which is, so, give me some hope, right? I mean, like, who was it? Like, where can we look to for hope? Oh, I'm gonna find you. Um, like, I, we need some hope in here, right? So like, is that the thing to like, we should be looking for? Like, is those moments where that kind of longing is, unleashed. Let me just suggest that, <laughs> that we need to think more long term. I mean, this is, this is about the long game. And, um, you know, crises are often moments of opportunity. They can often be exciting and they can lead to new ways of looking at the problem in, in ways that, you know, instead of trying, and now we're all trying to solve it. And so we're applying one set of tools but there's, and it's, you know, it's important to try to do that. But at the same time, there, there, there's consolation in also taking a more philosophic approach, it's not as a substitute to much more practical ones, but, but to taking a step back and, and seeing where we are in time and understanding it historically and understanding there's still a long way to go. Um, and things are working themselves out. We don't have a, a grasp of the whole picture, but this, these, Moments of vitality, Kaushik's right, they're everywhere. They're in class, they're in the street. What will come of it, I, I don't know. But we don't. I, I want us to be careful, though. I mean, hope springs eternal, but it sure. doesn't necessarily solve systemic racism, yeah. right? Or uh, the systemic exclusion of sure. communities. And so while I, of course, and, and I agree that there is democratic vitality, I, and part of that could be the nature of the human being to work collectively, to insist, in fact, of being heard, to being a part of the system. I don't want to suggest that that vitality is enough. Of course, we want to point to these opportunities of innovation, which we, we do see flowering, but we also see kind of the concerns around the attack on institutions that Kashik has noted, right? The systemic nature of and the pervasive nature of racism that inhibits many different people from fully participating in the system. There are not a crisis, but there are real kind of problematic um, issues that are a part of our democracy that aren't fixed 
by just hope. And yes. that to fix them will require investment and intention and resources and strategy. It won't work itself out on its own. It, it might that... also, it all, might also, and I'm, it might also mean that in fact, if we go back to that prior uh, question, that we're less invested in fixing democracy and more invested in fixing governance and representation and voice. Uh, that What's the difference you're trying? What's the distinction? Because you're in to fact, draw? to fix that might not mean to be beholden to a democratic system in the way in which we imagine it today, but in fact, to be open to reimagining the ways in which um, people are a part of the political system, the ways in which people might have access to innovate and to change, the ways in which we might shift how power is distributed within the country, political power within the country. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Marco. I don't think I disagree with, with Kathy. I, I think okay. that's absolutely important. Um, but I wonder at the same time, you know, all I'm suggesting is that, you know, we can approach the world in more ways than one, obviously, mm -hmm. right? And so one framework is simply to um, look problems straight in the eye and, and think about what we can do to, to do our best to solve them. But oftentimes that, that can lead to a sense of frustration and a sense of, um, so sometimes in addition to that, not as a substitute, but in addition to that, um, sometimes we can also respond in a way that is, is simply to remain vigilant and, and to, to pay attention, to listen. And, and I think that allows for a, a creative exercise of, of, you know, of seeing what's unfolding and acting at the moment when the opportunity arises. And, and I think, you know, I, I don't think one approach excludes the other. I, I think in some ways both are necessary in order not to get mired down and bogged down and feel hopeless. We have to have a capacity to think beyond our situation, beyond ourselves, mm -hmm. beyond our groups, beyond our communities, and to look at the larger span. I mean, 200 years, that's a long time, right? We're here. So, you know, things aren't perfect. Nobody's going nobody's to argue that that's the case. But we've achieved so much still. Not enough, but something, and it's worth holding on to. So, you know, I, I think that perspective can sometimes be a source of um, hope, perhaps. Is, I don't know if that's the right word. <laughs> Nancy Carlton was asking for four hopes. So one of the things you're pointing to then is um, uh, right perspective and that rather than panning back and seeing the enormity of the challenge and the long history, both of failure and of progress, um, as a source of disenchantment, but that one can find meaning in that and purpose in that. And yeah? I think we have to. I, I think, you know, if, if we're not to become cynical, I think we have to. So we need, uh, there are a number of people here who are asking, like, what can I do, right? The, and, and I think the, to say find perspective, they actually want to get to work. Some of these people, right? They, they feel the sense of urgency of this moment, both as it's expressing itself domestically and the challenges that are happening abroad. And they want to they wanna make a difference. And if, we, if you, had, if you were to tell somebody, here's, here's something you can actually do, what, what would you tell them? How people vote. So, I mean, I remember in the early 90s, I still remember the early 90s in Poland, where uh, practicing democracy was extremely difficult because there would be 35 parties running in, in the parliamentary election, half of which were created just to muddle the waters and not allow another party get enough uh, name recognition. And uh, the way to help democracy function was to basically give people cheat sheets and figure out which party to vote for if those are indeed the values that they want represented. And I think that, you know, everybody knows somebody who could use some help with political information or helping getting them to the vote or, you know, taking their shift at work when they can't get off or they'll lose their job in order to go and vote. So it's small things at the local level. I mean. Others? Vote. Put pressure on your senator to get rid of the filibuster. No, but but more. But, 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 and the electoral college. And the elect <laughs> but, but 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 more. But more seriously, I don't want to give up on institutions. But I think that there's a radical need for institutional democratization, mm -hmm. right? Like the filibuster. I think that the filibuster is not important in and of itself. It's important because it's part of a process of democratizing the legislature. And so there's a whole set of questions here about how do we democratize our institutions? What does democratizing the judiciary mean? 
What does democratizing our corporations mean? What does democratizing Wall Street mean? What does democratizing the university mean? That's not just about free speech. It's about creating spaces for voices that were previously excluded from participation to actually meaningfully participate within institutional settings as well. And I think that's a, that's a complicated and a long-term and yeah. a serious challenge, but I think we can all participate in that in the institutional spaces that we're involved in. I have three ideas. If you um, live in a state that allows citizens referenda and initiatives, and you don't yet have a, a nonpartisan electoral commission mm -hmm. drawing the district lines, make that your priority, because that is the single biggest thing we could do to reclaim our democracy, along with ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing to do. Uh, learn about and support the Electoral College Majority mm -hmm. Pact, which is a, a, basically an agreement among states so that the national majority vote winner would always be the president of the United States, and we're not too far away from that. And that's also something you could do in a bunch of states. If you live in a state like ours, where all those things are already taken care of, you know, um, move to Wyoming. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> okay. That's a good start, um, and that's as far as we can do in, uh, in an hour and 20 minutes together talking about this big issue, but it's a terrific start. Thank you for a compelling conversation. This was the final Harper Lecture of this season. Please keep your eye out for announcements about ones to come in the future. Have a great night. <laughs>